we've got a system of schooling which gives a completely different impression. It's all graded. And what we do is we put the child into the corridor of this grade system with a kind of, come on, kitty, kitty, kitty. And yeah, you go to kindergarten, you know. And that's a great thing because when you finish that, you'll get into first grade. And then come on, first grade leads to second grade and so on, and then you get out of grade school, and you go to high school, and it's revving up, the thing is coming. Then you're going to go to college, and by Joe, then you get into graduate school, and when you're through with graduate school, you go out to join the world. And then you get into some racket where you're selling insurance. And they've got that quota to make. And you're going to make that. And all the time, this thing is coming. It's coming. It's coming. That great thing, the, the success you're working for. Then when you wake up one day about 40 years old, you say, my God, I've arrived. <laughs> I'm there. And you don't feel very different from what you always felt. And there's a slight letdown. But supposing that I say to you, each one of you is really the great self, you know, the Brahman. And you say, well, yeah, all you've said up to now makes me fairly sympathetic to this intellectually. But I don't really feel it. What must I do to feel it really? My answer to you is this. You ask me that question because you don't want to feel it really. You're frightened of it. And therefore what you're going to do is you're going to get a method of practice so that you can put it off. So that I can say, well, I can be a long time on the way getting this thing. And uh, then maybe I'll be worthy of it after I have suffered enough. See, because we are brought up in a social scheme whereby we have to deserve what we get. And the price that one pays for all good things is suffering. But all of that is precisely postponement. Because one is afraid here and now to see it. If you have the nerve, you know, real nerve, you'd see it right away. Only that would be, you know, when one feels you, 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 you shouldn't have nerve like that. Well, that would be awful. That would be, that, 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 that wouldn't do at all. Because after all, I'm supposed to be poor little me. And uh, I'm not really much of a muchness. And I'm playing the role of being poor little me. And therefore, in order to be something great, like a Buddha or a uh, Jivan Mukta, one liberated in this life, I ought to suffer for it. So you can suffer for it. There are all kinds of ways invented for you to do this. And you can discipline yourself, and you can gain control of your mind, and you can uh, do all sorts of extraordinary things. I mean, you can drink water in through your rectum and uh, do the most fantastic thing. But that's just like being able to run the hundred yards in nine seconds or uh, push a peanut up Mount Tamalpais with your nose or any other kind of accomplishment you want to engage in. It's absolutely nothing to do with the realization of the self. The realization of the self fundamentally depends on coming off it. You know, the sort of, when we say to people who put on some kind of an act, and say, oh, come off it. And some people can come off it. They laugh and say they suddenly realize, you know, they're making fools of themselves, and they laugh at themselves, and they come off it. So in exactly the same way, the guru, the teacher, is trying to make you come off it. Now, if he finds he can't make you come up, then he's going to put you through all these exercises. So that you, at the last time, when you've got enough discipline, and enough suffering, and enough frustration, you'll give it all up. And realize you were there from the beginning, and there was nothing to realize. But the guru is very clever. He says, all right, if this is the way you have to go, this is the way you have to go. You asked for it. You came to me, I didn't invite you, you see, the guru says. You came to me and said, I want to learn yoga. Well, he said, uh, yoga is union. 
you, you are Tatramasi, you know, you're that. Well, now you say, I'm sorry, I don't understand that, because I only get it intellectually, I don't feel it. Oh, he says, you're one of those. <laughs> so, see, I've got to satisfy you, the customer is always right, no? I've got to give you all this work to do, because you can't see directly that this is so. But he's looking at you in a funny way, you see, the, uh, the guru is always saying to you, you know, what are you, what are you doing? What's your game? Imagine, for example, a father confessor and you feel terribly guilty that you've committed murders and robberies and adulteries and fornications and all kinds of arson and injury to people and financial shenanigans and you go to this man and say, I am a terrible sinner. <sighs> really, he says, I have murdered somebody, he says, how many times? <laughs> and uh, you think, oh good lord, this man doesn't realize how awful I am. And you recite all these things, he's perfectly calm. And uh, then you say to him, well, uh, you don't seem to be very shocked. He said, you haven't confessed any serious sin. He said, what do you mean by serious sin? Well, he said, uh, what do you think? Well, I don't know, I, uh, I just feel wrong. I just feel there's something in the basis of me that feels, that tells me that I am not what I ought to be. Uh, could it be that I'm spiritually proud? That I'm egocentric? There's no, that's not, it's very usual, this is quite ordinary sin. Uh, but he says, you, you, you are guilty of something, something really terrible. And uh, what could that be? I have no idea. Now he says, come on, come on. Go deeper. What is the real sin you've committed? Do you think, what, me? I, little me, could do something worse than murder, than worse than spiritual pride? Just little me? I mean, I'm a reasonably well-intentioned person. What could that be? And he looks at you in a funny way. He says, you know. You know, it gets a kind of a Kafka-esque situation where you're accused of a crime that's not specified. And, uh, and yet the, the accuser says, you jolly well know what you've done. Of course, we can't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's like the, 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 those laws that... Uh, are on the books of the state of California and several other states where people are accused of the abominable crime against me. Nobody knows what it is. It can't be mentioned. It's too dreadful to be talked about. So this guy does the same thing, but it's in a different dimension. You tell me. Now what? Well, what did you do? See, the real crime is that you won't admit your God. That's false modesty. <laughs> so the guru challenges, you see. He challenges you. If you raise the person, he doesn't go out and preach in the street. Say, come on everybody, you ought to be converted. He sits down under a tree and waits. And people start coming around and they offer him propositions. He answers back. And he challenges in any way that he thinks is appropriate to your situation. Now, if you've got a thin shell and your mask is easily dispatched with, he simply uses a, what we might call an easy method. He says, listen Shiva, come up here. <laughs> Don't pretend you're this guy here. I know who you are. And the guy sort of twinkles a bit and says, um, well, I guess you're right. <laughs> but the people aren't like that. They have very thick shells. And so he has to invent ways of cracking them. So here's how it goes.
for a few reminders. We're back here with you. And uh, let me bring in Swami. Go ahead, Swami. Namaste, everyone. <laughs> I really do love that clip. I do. It just makes me smile. Um, we well, all see, see you're, you're living that. Yes. You're living that, though. So that's going to mean a lot more to you than, than a, a lot, lot of folks. <laughs> Um, um, for those that, that, that I guess don't know what that means, um, talking to speech is my birthday. So, um, yeah, I've been, uh, a lot of this has a lot of meaning. That's what this whole thing is, is to realize that the spiritual path that we are all going forward in um, allows us to learn something that we were not necessarily aware of prior to now. And, and I can see it as beautiful. I really do. And um, hey, Dr. Joe, you're there as well with this. I saw you come back in. I saw you drop off and come back in, but your mic is open as well. So hey, Dr. Joe. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, hanging out and enjoying and contemplating all the things that we've talked about so far. And, um, oh, there's a million and one things I'd like to say you know, about our consciousness and about where we are and what's happening. And I mean, the key element, though, I mean, as Swami was kind of touching on it, he touched on a point that um, I kind of want to extrapolate on. And, um, and that there's, there's this, you know, the, the duality between mind and spirit. If you know. and, um, and for myself, I just uh, kind of a spectrum that I've uh, experienced. You know, when I had my first kind of death experience seven years ago, it was a full on, like leaving the body for 10 minutes and being pronounced dead, that whole kind of thing. Um, when I came back, I had about three weeks to a month where I could go in and out at will. And I, it was like the ultimate play down. I mean, I could play with this. I go in and out, in and out, and form, formless, form, formless, form, formless. And I, I had like thousands of times a day, and I got so good at it during that period that I could begin to kind of stop, like an elevator, if you will, at what I call the touch points where we begin to interface with this reality and um, or this perception of reality in this dimension. And as a result, I kind of created this spectrum. It used to be much larger, but I've, I've whittled it down to a very small spectrum of kind of seven interface points. And it's not the chakras. Every time I say seven, people go, oh, the chakras. Well, uh, it, that's not where it's at as far as that particular spectrum is concerned. But on either end of the spectrum, Swami actually spoke to that to a degree. because. On one end of the spectrum is what I call the SDR, the S, and that stands for Spiritually Driven Reality. And the SDR is where the end of this kind of like synaptic neuron that we call human being, where all the receptors for the brain, all of the thinking, and then the sub-receptors, which are, you know, like your senses and what have you, but there's there, that, 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 that singularity that is that separate receiver that is taking in all the information on of this. There's a moment-to-moment, -moment, constantly changing sensation that's occurring. And that constantly changing sensation and all that vibration and all those frequencies that are being received on all those levels simultaneously, that is where our life is occurring. That's where it's happening. That's the repeatlessness moment. That is the here and now, the eternal present, whatever you want to call it in that regard. But that is where our life is occurring. Is at that tip, at the tip of that sensor of that. It's almost like a, like a, you know, I, I see like a, a um, like a, like a, uh, oh, what would you call it? Come on, Joe. A fiber optic cable. And that's the tip of this cable. and has all these sensors on it. Well, that right where all that sensing is occurring at the tip of that cable on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. That's where our life is occurring. And then, uh, so that's the spiritually driven reality. On the other end of that spectrum then, in this perception of reality, we have what I call the PDR, the psychologically driven reality. And psychologically driven reality is exactly what, 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 what Swami was speaking into just a moment ago, where that is where it divides the indivisible, separates the inseparable, that takes all of those sensations that are coming in as a singularity and chops them up and puts them all into their little compartments so that we can organize and attempt to bring meaning to this experience. Now, the problem we have 
in consciousness, we want to look at it as a quote-unquote problem, but the situation that is occurring is that, you know, so we, we have this thing, the, the SDI, where it's actually occurring, and then we have this echo of organization called the PDR, the psychologically driven reality, where we divide it and do all this kind of stuff. And, and the situation is, is that we believe that that thing that is dividing and separating the inseparables and, and dividing the individuals, we believe that that's who we are. And as a result, when we identify with that thing that is doing all of that, we then are separate from all that and occurs. Other and other exists. Precisely. That other even exists. Precisely. Oh, yes. You know, exactly, Swami. Exactly. That other even exists. So now, you know, so one way to kind of characterize it is there's a, there's a, there's a Buddhist approach or a koan, and that is that, that um, one can either be scissor or needle and thread. Those are the only two choices that you have in this reality. In, in, if you have free will, you can choose to be scissors or needle and thread. And if you're scissors, you're identified with that PDR, the psychologically driven reality, and you're chopping up this reality and cutting it into all these little pieces and putting it into compartments. And if you choose to be needle and thread, you sit in the SDR and you take each one of those pieces and you sew them back together to create the, you know, the beautiful tapestry of what life is. And so... It's a wonderful thing saying we are love and we are these things and, and, and to, to, to begin to identify with all of that because it steers us kind of in a direction. But so it really steers us so away from realizing that everything that's around us, because that's what happens to most, is at this point most people that wake up and see reality or, or actually see things around them, they wake up and they, they walk outside the door and they think that everything is so overwhelming that there's so much that they can't have a possible effect or even control over their own lives that it becomes a serious issue. This is that whole red pill, blue pill, red pill, you know, if woken up, would you give it a chance to be back in the matrix because it is seriously an overwhelming presence that most see. And and that's that's the thing that this control grid has allowed, but the power that we all individually have and this change that is happening, this spiritual awakening, this this control awakening, realizing that the power is within ourselves and that's where we need to go, um, I think is is has actually changed that. It, it's no longer, okay, but it's still a bad thing. It's the fact that as long as we keep conceiving it as a bad thing, it will continue to be a bad thing. And, and that's where a lot of this problem lies, because we don't have faith in ourselves. We are nothing more than entertained automatons that are programmed, and that's exactly why they have programming, that are programmed to do nothing more than exist almost as holographic images so that those that maybe are aware can choose their own life. And, and do you want to be accepted as being one of those holograms? That's, you know, I, <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I personally, if I could say that, I think there's an I. You know, I mean, there's, there's this big movement now. You know, there's this big movement, and, and, and it's very interesting, you know, that, that's catching on even more so. And, you know, the teachings of St. Germain and the I am presence and now conscious languaging, and they start off with, I am that I am, you know, and, 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 and you just that I am that I am. That is the starting point in that, that languaging. And then from there, you know, when we're using affirmations, you know, I am love. And there's this, there's this thing, that's, there's this nebulous thing then called love, as opposed to, in conscious languaging, I am my love. I am my serenity. And really owning it in that regard. Yet, at the same, in the same breath, for myself, I am that I'm not. We are that we aren't, and it is that it isn't. In other words, <laughs> I've surrendered to the reality for myself that I am but just a synaptic waveform that is passing through all these other waveforms with its only function with inside all those waveforms is to attempt to harmonize the disharmonic frequencies that are, well, what we would identify as disharmony, you know. Um, 
but but to that 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 like my you know, and then people say, well, what about your will? You know, do you have will in your you know your personal and all this other kind of stuff? And for me, it is just simply a surrender. And and you know, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't right. identify myself as a Christian, you know, but they characterize it as not my will, but thy will. You know, right. uh, to surrender to the flow and to constantly be in service to that flow. That's uh, that's exactly the process and end point of yoga by mm -hmm. whatever by whatever words or set of words you may understand yoga uh, but this is the end point the the culmination of the human experience this is not when I say yoga I'm not simply referring to what the spandex laden people do at the YMCA right that's 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 part of it that's you know working on the body and the breath that's great that's where most people start uh, but then there are those who who have more expanded experiences that are not correlated to the physical body or the physical breath um, some have to die <laughs> repeatedly <Okay. laughs> yeah. and, and, and come back and talk about it from like, you know what, I wish I could teach you, but I died. I'd prefer you did. <laughs> <laughs> or if you said, here, I'll kill you. I know what's coming. Great. Here. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Really. I mean, it's way really overrated, man. You know, it's way really overrated. Just chill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Everything goes right in the end. You know, I'm glad you brought up that idea of yoga because there's a distinction in language for myself that, that made a huge difference. You know, I also am a Swami, Swami Bodhisattva Sudeya, in the, in the school of Tantra. And I don't, you know, the moment you say Tantra, everyone like, you know, the Western bastardization of it just being a sexual thing. That's just like the tip of the fingernail of really what Tantra is. But to characterize Tantra is where I even came up with my whole concept um, that I teach, which is called holosophy. And really, we're having a holosophic, you know, experience and conversation here. But in holosophy, um, it's the idea of the, the kind of distinction between yoga and, and tantra. And, and you know, we, we have this conversation that started, I guess Wayne Dyer kind of put it out there, and it became popular. You know, I'm a, am I a human having a spiritual experience or a spirit having a human experience? <laughs> and we had to, like, make a choice. And the reality is we're both. Right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, and so in that, the characterization between yoga and tantra, the, how I would characterize that is that yoga would be characterized on one level as, um, and, and both of them arrive at the same goal. So that one is better than the other. But both, uh, but, uh, but both of them are about cultivating the witness. Okay? There's this listener, uh, as we spoke about earlier, um, that which is perceiving, not that which then formulates ideas about what that which is perceived but the perceiver or the receiver or the listener. Um, so in yoga, it would be characterized as suppression with awareness. And we suppress our senses, our thoughts, our identifications, all the kinds of things, and we, we turn those off so that then we can identify with the witness which then takes us to our God consciousness which then we experience the oneness. And, and it's very effective, and, and that's like 99% of everything that's out there. Now, Tantra, though, would be characterized very differently than that. Once again, you're cultivating the witness, but what it is, it, what it is, is the characterization as opposed to suppression with awareness, it is indulgence with awareness. In other words, you indulge in your pain. You indulge in your fears. You indulge in all of these things and really feel them to the, 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 you know, the nth degree so as to embrace all the aspects of yourself, where that's where philosophy comes from. And, and, and at the same time, you have to remain witness to it all, though, so that it is happening, but you are not having it. You're simply just observing the brain, the biocomputer, the separation, the PDI, the psychologically driven reality. You're observing that whole thing as if you were observing Process something outside of yourself. <laughs> Precisely. And allow it to occur. Now, the thing for myself is that when I was, being brought through all of my yogic practices and all of my suppression with this awareness, I was actually denying my humanity. And as I was transferred 
you know, 30, 20, 30 years ago into this whole tantra practice of really indulging in my humanity, I actually was, it, it was embracing all that I am. And so, you know, it's, 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 it seems so critical in so many ways that all these distinctions and all the separation consciousness and all the stuff of them and, and all of that is rooted kind of in that denial of being that, that that is who we are. There's not a human being that's not violent. There's not a human being that's not aggressive. There's not a human being that's not selfish. There's not a human being that's not a murderer. There's not a human being uh, any life form. You know, they would say, well, there's degrees of murder. There's a human murder. But, I mean, you know, you kill flies, you kill scorpions, you kill bugs, you kill... I mean, killing is killing. It's taking life. It's extinguishing. It's on different levels, but it's still killing. I mean, so the point is, is that everything that's out there, we are. And if we can accept that and, and, and really embrace the truth of, that, of, the, of those words, it is then that we really, truly can be, be whole truly be whole, and as if we are whole in that regard, then we can truly exercise compassion. Because when we see someone else who is in that realm or in that form, we can say, wow, yeah, you know, I, I identify with that inside myself, you know, and maybe we can go this way, though. You know, have you ever considered that? But if you're, but if you're in the denial of saying, I'm not that way, and you're wrong, and you're bad, then we just polarize it and perpetuate it. Oh, it's so much easier to separate not allowing a lot of this um, control forces to exist. This whole idea that, that this whole evil, bad, right, wrong, light, dark, <laughs> when it's, it's literally like the two sides of the same coin. It, it, it's not like they're separate. They're still together. It's this idea that, again, there's plenty of time, like what we started before, I guess that was like a couple hours ago, but still, this whole, we are limited to our linear experience and our linear uh, perception more than anything else, that everything has to have a beginning and an end, that everything has to have a start and, and everything must die. <clears throat> Basically, this is where, where we exist here and now. Um, the problem is, is that existence and life and, and reality and, and the source and love and, and everything that makes us who we are and that ties us all together and this beauty and, and wonder and creativity and imagination is not limited to these linear constraints that we have allowed, like this brain, this nothing more than a computer problem. It, 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 and like you were stating about experiencing something beyond this, is that once you try to put it in linear terms or or process it through our our processor, our brain, then it 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 makes it hard to speak about because there isn't something truly tangible on linear concepts that can explain what one goes through. Um, at least from my opinion and my point of view. <laughs> Again, it is our personal experience. <laughs> Agreed. Yes. Yeah, I'm just listening. Keep going, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you go, girl. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, the thing is, is that you know, whew, you know, the, the the seriousness of it all. You know, we get so serious about it. You know, and 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 and. and the importance of having a position, you know, to having a, a, a position from which, uh, you know, um, that we have to, to, to defend almost, you know. Um, when we sit in the idea that if everything, you know, if, if the law of repeatlessness is true, which, you know, it, it's a law, therefore, it's, you know, it's self-governing and self-perpetuating that every moment is fresh and new. If that's true, then every moment is completely and totally unknown and everything is fresh and new so if every, every moment is unknown and every moment is fresh and new we've got quite a problem here because we've got this thing called the prefrontal cortex you know and the prefrontal lobe and its job you know when we got it you know a couple thousand years ago when the prefrontal lobe began to develop we began its job was to predict the future to be a life simulator 
And so it was really great when we had adversaries and we were having to save ourselves from saber-toothed tigers and get into the cave to keep warm and we had all these kind of things like that, but we're no longer in that survival mode, yet this particular part of the brain has continued to grow and has continued to need to justify its existence. And so as we as, as, we, as a species and as this prefrontal lobe has, has developed, it went from having actual adversaries to having what I call having to manufacture illusory adversaries in order to justify its existence. Now the big problem with the you know uh, with 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 the prefrontal lobe is that its job is to predict the future, but if the future is completely unknown and fresh and new. It can never truly be right. Well, and and then the whole thing is is that everything goes on all at once, and this idea of having to have control over where things go, knowing that. Nothing is completely predictable. Think about, I guess, like even a lake or a stream or something. I mean, you can pretty much say the way things should go or the path that it will follow, but if you if you sit there and try to change it or affect it to make it go down a certain path, then that alters the reality that we are a part of now. And, and, and so trying to go to something that, that helps you predict the future or something that helps you scry or read, it's something that, it, it's not necessary. It's, it's, life is, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, we you are. Know. I am. Um, that's yeah. a beautiful thing. <laughs> Amen. Those Such patients, a simple and short thing to say that means so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, for myself, anybody can toss know, it out of their lips. Yeah. Well, for myself, you know what 2012 represents in in for myself is the disillusionment or the you know the letting go of this prefrontal lobe and letting go of this predictive nature and this knowing nature. You know, and it's very much, uh, I like, I've done enough biblical things just keep coming into my brain today as far as, you know, <laughs> I, I know, you know, it's been years since I've been in that reality. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of that, that, that sense of awe and that sense of wonder and that sense of not knowing and just like, oh my gosh, look at this. And, and, and just simply embracing what is. And, you know, if there's a function for humanity, or, you know, for, for, you know, that's another thing. That's a whole other concept. You know, I introduced that idea of the MOS, you know, the Mutual Admiration Society. And I think each one of us are, you know, MOS, uh, we're MOS as, which I would say, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, Mutual Admiration Advocates or Ambassadors right here, you know. Well, we um, Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, but the, and there's other ideas, you know, like in some realms you say the word Christianity and there's like a cringe, like this, yeah. or Catholicism, there's like a, yeah. and, and, and there's even that now, you know, amongst like the Burning Man crowd and, and, and a community in that society and a whole bunch of people, that the moment you say spirituality, there's like a, yeah. and it goes into new age and metaphysics and all these other kind of stuff. And so I've been, I, I've sort of struggled with that because I'm real comfortable with any of the terms. You know, from any of the religions or any of the descriptions, I, I'm perfectly comfortable with all of them because they're all trying to describe, describe the same thing and make little distinctions. But so I'm adding a new distinction, and instead of spirituality or Christianity or humanity, all of a sudden, I'm calling it humanality. That we can no more deny that we are radiant beings that are taking in energy and and, and radiating it out. I mean, we've got all the tools and measurements that there's a huge donut around you, unless your magnetic field that's coming from your heart chakra and going out, that like, we can measure now, it used to be only 15 feet, now we've gotten it out to 50 feet. That I can actually measure the pulse of your vibration and what you're emanating 50 feet from you and a giant donut around you. So we can no longer, we can no more deny that than we could deny that we have a hand or a foot. And it's not about the woo-woo metaphysic spirituality, it's just part of being human. And so I'm stepping outside of even the spiritual realm in that regard and just stepping into this new concept of humanality. And humanality just embraces all that we are and it ties into that whole philosophy. And it ties into, you know, and, and so there's only one function I can figure I'm on the planet. And, and I, as, a, as a separate kind of, you know, meat water 
sack that's animated in this dimension. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that, that is to uplift and nurture all life on the planet. I mean, you have plants. And these plants take the poison that we call carbon dioxide and it transforms it into oxygen, which then allows other life forms to live. In the same way, we are transmuters. And what we're transmuting is a vibration that we would call hate, anger, or disdain, or, or you know, whatever has that rah kind of behind it, the selfishness, the self-preservation. We touched on that earlier in the conversation, but that, 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 you know, when you're identified with the mind, it's all about the self, and it's all about preserving yourself, and all about greed, and I need more, and my people need more, and la, 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 la. And when we're identified in spiritually driven reality, SDR, it's, it's all about everyone. And, and, and it's all about what is the best for everyone, and it's almost like characterized between the difference between sorcery and wizardry. Sorcery is using the energetics and the energies that you have for the good of oneself at the expense of anyone. And wizardry would be using those energetics and the things that we are, the actualities that we are, and using all of that in order for the good of everyone at the expense of no one. And so what we are witnessing currently is the use of all these manifestation skills and all of these things, whether it's through technology or money or greed and systems and all this stuff, all of that is sorcery. And it's all based in the identification with the mind and the separation and self-preservation. And, and it's whole idea of having to have, the only problem I have with all that is the whole idea of having to have a physical representation to do something that we already do. I don't like the idea, I guess, again, it comes back to the terms being used. Um, because once you say like sorcery or, or even bring up the word magic, I mean, there's these whole ideas that form in, in, in a person's mind. And, and okay, again, we're trying to get away from the mind thing, I get that, but uh, you think it, 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 maybe it's just me, it bothers me, I guess. Well, in the, in the humanality, in the humanality, there's not a single life form on this planet, in this dimension as we perceive it, that is not manipulating energy some way is not using energy in some way, transforming it, transmuting it, whether it's a tiger that's growling and using that energetic to get something away from it, or another animal that's, you know, that's scratching or, 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 or just digesting or just living in peace. We are all, there's a life form on this planet that is not manipulating or using energy in some way. And so I just characterized it as such that how do we interface and use this energy, energy, and it's either we're going to use this energy to either benefit everyone or benefit ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so sorcery, I just use that because it's, I mean, it, you know, it, it is, we are all energy transmitters and transducers and receivers and all of that. And, and all of this are natural processes that happen within our existence, within this realm or within this matrix we all, we all co-create. But nonetheless, um, these are natural processes, and, and the only problem I have is the need to have to control them. Um, we yeah. are a part of it. Um, yeah. Therefore, it is us as much as, as we are an individual. So there's this idea that, that it's necessary to have to go through a ritual to have an effect on something that you are already that you already are. Um, I guess that's... Yeah, but you're, you're, I, mean, you're too, it's, I think it's a, it's a false premise to, to think that any one of us are going to maintain, you know, at this point right now, maintain that perfect clear vision that is constantly in the oneness and constantly seeing that all the time. Because in our, in our humanity and in the philosophy, we're both. We're, we're, we are that and we are then the brain. And so if we're going to be having to interface with this thing called the brain, there are certain models, I think, that are more useful and helpful towards remembering the oneness than there are not, <laughs> you know? And so, I, I mean, I myself, I have, I have I've experienced and seen quite a lot through my experiences. And, 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 um, and at the same time, I will it's never great. say that... Which is beautiful, right? I mean, that's what made it... Well, yeah. But I'm not going to pretend, though. I'm not going to pretend, though. See, that's the thing. You know, it, 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 you know. That's why I said I want to run on Mr. Death or something like that. Because there's all these preconceived ideas that if you've died and you've come back, now you're supposed to be Mr. Holy and Jesus, and you touch someone and they can heal and all this other kind of stuff. And and it's just like you know, as long as you're in a body, man, you got issues. 
and, <laughs> and you're having a human right. experience, and it's about you know, like you all trip over the sidewalk too. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Yeah, I put on one shoe one at a time, you know, just like everybody else. Yeah. I put my leg, you know, my pants on one leg at a time. I mean, you know, and, and, and so it all comes down to, you know, what was happening in the chat room here, and I think somebody said to Swami, and he, he, he responded, you know, that um, there's only the moment. You know, and whatever we can use to keep us in that moment and to step out of, you know, fear, and fear for me is just once again identifying with the PDR and it's letting the prefrontal lobe do its thing and so we create these fantasized events that appear as real, F-E-A-R, these fantasized events that appear as real and the moment we go anywhere but here and now, we're missing what's happening. You know, it's like what John Lennon says, you know, life's what happens while you're making other plans. <laughs> and so, realistically, it's like, if, if, you know, and have either one of you seen the movie I Am yet? No. I okay, there's a, new do there's a new documentary out there called I Am, and um, I think it was filmed some time ago, but now it's, it's just recently got distribution. I really it's recommend anyone listen. It's about everything about life, basically. Um, well, it's, it's a movie about a fellow who, uh, who went through a traumatic experience and, um, and was really kind of not suicidal but inviting death because of all the pain that he was in as a result of this neurological disorder. He was just constantly in pain and medical couldn't de medicine couldn't deal with it. And no matter what they threw at him, he was just in severe agonizing pain for like nine months. And he didn't want to kill himself, but he was just like, you know, I can't deal with this anymore. And, you know, I just, it was just too much. It was just overwhelming. Anyway, so he went through a whole process. And then he started, you know, and then the, 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 the briefly touched about that process. But his, his idea was, you know, to, he asked the question, well, what would I say if I had the last thing to say to humanity? What would it be? And he, he had some questions like, you know, why are we here? And really what's going on? And all this other kind of stuff. And so he went around and interviewed people um, uh, about this, various, you know, consciousness and quantum physicists and, and stuff like that. It was a very short film, about an hour and 15 minutes. But one of the points in the film that was extraordinary was um, sociologists and biologists were working together and studying um, animal behavior. And, you know, that, 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 that we have accepted in the Darwinian kind of form that there's this hierarchical level of reality within the species that the strong survive and the dead, you know, and the weak, you know, perish. And, and, and there's a whole aspect of Darwin's work that was completely ignored. And that, um, and that, that the key element within his work was talking about love and the oneness and unanimity. I can't say the word, you know, unanimity, yeah. And, um, but as they studied different, like they, they were studying these caribou, I think it was a you know it was a deer tribe, and they thought that you know the buck with all the horns there were several of them they were the ones that were in control and that they were the ones leading, you know the the the, the herd, and so as they studied them they noticed that the the bucks were actually sitting outside and kind of looking, and there's this kind of real interesting balance because they're all out on the prairie, and they have so many miles to go to get to water. And it's getting hot out, yet they need to graze so that they have enough energy. And if they leave too soon, they wouldn't have eaten enough, and then they'll, they'll, they won't be able to make it to the water. And if they leave, and they'll get too hot. And if they leave too late, um, uh, the, the other animals that would be their predators would be near the water. So there's a fine thing. And so they're trying to figure out how do they decide where to go. And what they observed is it was not the buck that finally said, okay, time to go. What happened was is that they're all grazing, and there's like a thousand of them out there, and, and, and all of a sudden one would look up towards the direction, and there were three directions they could go for water. One would look up in that direction, and then another one would look up in that direction, and over a period of time, all of a sudden, like when the 501st deer would look up and face that direction, then they all went at the same time. And the bucks actually turned out to just be the guardians. They weren't the leaders at all. They were just kind of the guardians protecting them from any predators that might be coming in. And so then they studied starlings, and they studied how they travel in time. And there's kind of thousands of this group decision of where they're going to go. And you see the fish, the school of the fish that are swimming, and all of a sudden you're turning left, all of a sudden they're up and down. And that is how life occurs. And so in that same way, as each one of us sits in the place and no longer identifies with that thinking mind, 
In other words, it's not about going out there and trying to lead the people into the new thing. It's about sitting and, and identifying with what Swami's talking about. And even what, what you know, what, what um, oh God, why, why did my brain just go dead? Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Raven was talking about that, um, not you, Nikki, but what Raven was talking about, that, that, that path going within and, and, and that deep listening so that when we get to that hundredth monkey, if you will, that, that, that critical mass, and I actually believe it's already occurred. I, re I really believe that the, the, the wave of human consciousness that we've, we've crested over that and that we're all heading in this one direction, but because we've got this mind that's kind of grab onto these other definitions of how it should be as opposed to just being with how it is and letting go and surrendering to the flow of really being together and working together, well, hey, guys. That, that, hey, um, you gotta go? Joe? Well, yeah, we're just out of time, so you want to make a last comment? <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, you know, love yourself. Relax into the fact that you're beautiful just as you are. If there's one affirmation that I teach, it's I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm at peace as I am. Nothing bad, nothing needs to change, and I leave you with that, that each of us are at peace as we are and just embrace each other, love each other, and we're on our way already. That was quite a, a nice statement. So thank you so much, Dr. Joe, and um, I'll be uh, emailing you, um, if not today, tomorrow. So um, hopefully we'll speak soon. Sounds great. All right, thanks. And um, Swami, dear Swami, <laughs> namaste as always. <laughs> And um, any uh, last comments from you? Oh, wait. Um, Great no, love. And no, hold on. It didn't work. Um, your mic was muted. Sorry, I apologize. I, I hit the wrong one. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello. I greet you all with great love and great respect. Simple and um, beautiful as always. <laughs> um, Namaste to everyone. I'm going to play a quick song. Um, beautiful. It's a beautiful show. It's like, seriously, um, I've had a, a great time. Um, oh, let's see, when will I be on next? Uh, Monday, actually. Um, 4.30 Eastern, 3.30 Central. Um, that's 1.30 Pacific. And then following this show, we've got John Reddy from the Liberty Underground, the Reddy Report coming up. So be sure to Tune in for that. And um, Swami, I look forward to speaking to you again as always. And um, everybody just realize this is a beautiful day and um, we do have the ability to rise above the humanization. So have fun. Enjoy your uh, weekend and your Friday and see you Monday. Right. This is the control grid to track and trace and make it a second-class citizen. They are going to decide what sites you visit, and they're only going to allow a couple thousand sites. 99% of the web will be off-limits.